Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Once again, this is Jeffrey Van Dyke, and uh, I am on the line with my sister, Kimberly. And uh, I've never asked my sister to uh, hop online with our community or uh, anything like that. She's not directly in, quote unquote, this field uh, of transformation and business and all that good stuff. But um, I've seen a lot of questions uh, online and social media. In fact, I saw uh, uh, somebody here from LA, and you know who you are, um, post a, a really earnest question uh, the other day about like, what was this Women's March really about? And do we need one? And wait, don't we already have women's rights? And, um, you know, all, all of those sorts of questions on one hand. And then on the other hand, uh, questions about, you know, spiritually, aren't we meant to move towards what we want instead of fighting against something, right? And um, because you guys have heard me say a million times, you cannot change that which you cannot love, um, right? And so, like, how does marching fit into that spiritual principle? And um, uh, you guys saw my email saying that uh, my sister, Kimberly, and her youngest daughter, Bella, went to the march in D.C. And we were texting over the weekend, and then um, yesterday I was driving home, and um, we had a chance to actually talk on the phone. And I was so inspired by her perspective of the march and her experience of it. Now, of course, this is one person's perspective and one human's experience. And I'm sure there are as, as many different perspectives and human's experiences there were marchers. Um, but... I found something valuable in what Kimberly had to share, and I just said, hey, would you be willing to do a spontaneous conversation with my community? And uh, she graciously said yes. Um, so I, I wanna just share um, a little bit about my sister, then I wanna interview her for a little while, um, and then we'll see if we have time to open up for Q&A or maybe some of you are at the march and want to share your experience. Um, this is by no means meant to be something where I am here to tell you what it's about, uh, what you should believe. But instead, when I see so many questions around, it inspired me to go, okay, there's a conversation that wants to happen here. And so that's really what the intent behind this is for me. Um, so uh, just a few notes about my sister. Um, Kimberly lives in Wilson, North Carolina, a town of about 50,000 people, which is about 45 minutes outside of Raleigh. Um, and she does uh, sort of city management, urban economic revitalization, uh, her whole career has been working for people who are traditionally underserved um, and uh, doing really tangible, earthy, on the ground things to make the world a better place. So whether that's early, early, early in her career, uh, being a director of a Head Start program and working with uh, migrant workers' children in the Heart Head Start program, or starting her own nonprofit in Grand Rapids, Michigan to revitalize 10 different uh, economically dep depressed business districts, or moving to Wilson, North Carolina, which was at one time the tobacco capital of the world, and uh, uh, taking a pretty vacant downtown and breathing new life into it with a local folk artist and uh, new restaurants and new living spaces. Um, and what I know about my sister is she's always had a heart for the underserved. She's always had a uh, desire to take very tangible steps to make the world a better place in really real ways for people in her own community. Um, so uh, that's just a little of my perspective on my sister and um, where I think she might come to the march from. So, uh, First, let me ask you, Kim, when you first heard about it, I remember over the holidays you were saying you thought you were going to go. Um, why did you want to go? Um, well, 
You know, I, like you mentioned, sort of my background has been all about, uh, you know, building community. And when I say building community, to me, that means uh, if you dissect that word, right, it's come unity, right? Come unity. Um, and so that's really been what a lot of my life's work has been about. And um, no matter what your political persuasion is, um, I think a lot of people would agree that um, uh, that unity part of community has been something that seems to have uh, been uh, framed, right? Um, and uh, seems to have been uh, taken a beating. And, um, and so that just has really not set right with me over the last, um, I don't know exactly how long, but well, maybe my whole life, but particularly we're in this sort of politically divisive time. And um, that's really, you know, kind of just worn on my soul. And, uh, and then of course, lately we've gotten into this place where things have gotten kind of really ugly and nasty and sort of not civil, kind of seems like lacking civil society. And so, um, you know, when I heard about this march, it, I, I just felt, I felt like I needed to do something and I didn't exactly know what. And so mm -hmm. when I heard about this march, I just, I, I felt like I should go. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was just, I was drawn to that and I didn't, I didn't know exactly to what to expect. And I couldn't say a hundred percent, you know, exactly why I was going or exactly what I thought I would get out of it. But I, I felt compelled to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're probably like a lot of people of like, I don't really know why I was going. I just felt compelled. There was something in me that wanted to be a part of something. And I don't, you know, I think also there's a feeling of helplessness that a lot of people have experienced of like, I don't know what I can do, right? And right. so to bring uh, a bit more of like, oh, here's something tangible. I can put my feet on a ground in a place at a time. Right, yeah. So, um, Here's what I really want to hear is like, what was it like showing up? What was it like being in DC? Oh, what was that experience like? Sure. Um, so, um, you know, I, I feel like the, you know, the world is somewhat out of balance and then spiritually speaking, I feel like, um, you know, we, we have at least in this country at this time, um, such a sort of lopsided masculine energy happening right now. And while masculine energy is beautiful and needed um, and represents a whole lot of wonderful things, um, just like feminine energy, if you get too much of it and it gets lopsided, you know, things get out of balance. And so that brings you things like, you know, oppression and war. Um, and so, you know, that feminine energy just seems to be not only lacking in many regards, but also under assault um, right now. Um, and so when I went up to DC, I went with a, a wonderful group of people from my, uh, my daughter's school, uh, the director of the school and some teachers. And, uh, you know, we, like I said, I didn't know what to expect, but I, I woke up feeling really excited, a little nervous. Um, you know, for safety reasons and things like that, but really excited. And we drove to um, Arlington, the Arlington Metro, Arlington Cemetery. There's a metro stop there, um, and got on the metro there. And you know, the the, the subway was was packed. And as we um, got on the train, you could just feel the energy, and it was just so positive. And you know, usually if you're on public transportation, and more and more people are packing in, right? Uh, people start to get irritated and you know but in this case as more and more people were packing in um people would cheer and say yay <laughs> <laughs> you know come on in and, and then people kind of look no there's not room and people would holler down the you know the car but scoot in make more room and you know everybody did that and um it, it was just amazing the whole ride you know which was stop and start because all the trains were backed up and then getting to the subway station and getting off and it taking half an hour to 45 minutes just to get out of the train and up the steps uh -huh. because there were so many people, but the energy was so positive and I was just struck by that because again, usually that type of situation, people would be elbowing each other. People would be getting upset. Um, you had, you know, the Metro workers, you know, high-fiving people <laughs> and, 
it was, you know, I was just struck by the positivity of that experience walking out into the street, into the crowd, listening to the speakers and the performers, and then the, and then the march. The whole entire thing was, it was really positive. There were people that were talking, um, you know, people have some sort of righteous indignation right now, which I think is understandable. And there was some amount of, we could say, uh, current president bashing. Um, but it was so much less than the positive sort of camaraderie and feeling that, that positive feminine spirit really emerging and being so supportive and so much uh, camaraderie and synergy. It was just absolutely electrifying. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is going to be completely subjective, uh, but I'm curious as you were there, like with your feet on the ground in DC, what did you feel like was the bigger thing that was happening? Like what energy was emerging, you know? Yeah. So um, a couple things. One thing is just, I think it was hopefulness. You know, mm -hmm. I think that when all those people, you know, nobody knows what to expect, right? Mm -hmm. All those people show up and suddenly, you know, you, you hear there's going to be a lot of people there and then suddenly there are, I mean, there are more people than you could possibly ever imagine showing up. And, um, you know, so I think that you felt this hopefulness because you, you felt like you weren't alone. Hmm. You had a hmm. voice again, you know, you weren't the, you weren't the voice in the wilderness, right? Yes. Um, clearly there were a million people standing, you know, on yeah, half a million people on either side of you, right? And and then there were people all over, apparently all over the world. I mean, I didn't really know until after I got home because I was in the middle of it. Um, yeah. The extent to which it sort of reverberated. So hope, that's one thing. Um, and then the second piece that just really struck me um, you know, because we do believe in, we, we are in a democracy and we do as, you know, Americans, we believe in this idea of, you know, governed by the people, right? But that seems to be increasingly lost. Yeah. And, um, and, and frankly, you know, what we saw in the Occupy Wall Street movement, right? That sort of effort, which sort of fizzled out and didn't sort of take, continue and take on a life of its own. But also, as we've sort of seen in the Tea Party movement, where people did also didn't feel like they had a voice. Yeah. That actually did get legs and, you know, has, has grown and actually changed our politics. Right. Not that I personally agree with a lot of things that people in the Tea Party are, are standing for, but the, the thing that I think is similar between sort of what, what I think might be happening here and what happened there is that people feel like they didn't have a voice. And so it's it's a vehicle for people to have a voice. And I think there's real opportunity there then for these people who feel like they're being left behind or left out of the conversation or belittled by other people and not allowed in the conversation um, is that, you know, maybe there's some ground to be forged there, mm -hmm. you know, as far apart as we may seem. Right. Right. Um, and then the other thing that was kind of blew me away was one of the speakers, and I can't remember which one, said, let's not forget that this march was organized by a mother, a yoga teacher, and a baker. Hold on, because that's the piece I didn't know about until you told me yesterday. So say again who organized this? I, I mean, I think it was several different people. I think, I don't know all the history, and a few different people in different parts of the country had this idea. And anyway, but you know, the, the person said something like, Let's not forget that this march was organized by a mother, a yoga teacher, and a baker. Right. So really ordinary people. Really ordinary people. No, no millionaire. No, uh, you know, uh, you know, rock star, movie star. Right. It was just ordinary people sort of coming together. Some, some of which I believe I'm not 100 percent sure if I'm accurate on this. Didn't even know each other. Connected online, I think. Um, and. You know, that happened right after the election and suddenly three months later, you've got millions of people marching in the streets, not just in the capital, but all over the country and all over the world. Yeah. That is the promise of democracy, yeah. right? That is the promise of, um, you know, people governing themselves.
Um, you know, yeah. yeah. I, Go ahead. I just think I just think that 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 was so empowering. You know, sort of no matter what your issues are, what what your platform is, like have we lost? You know, I in my work, you know, my my career, I get frustrated sometimes because the work I do does take the community collaborating to get it done, right? And oftentimes I feel like in this country, we've sort of lost this idea of citizenship and we less and less see ourselves as citizens of a place, of a city, of a state, of a country, and we see ourselves as consumers, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't, this place isn't cool enough or this place, you know, this place isn't working for me, right? And so I kind of go back to that, you know, the JFK is not what your country can do for you, what you can do for your country. And I think we've lost some of that and I think that this is the opportunity to reclaim our power. And uh, one of the signs, you know, the signs were amazing and everybody had these signs and people had these, <laughs> some of them were so clever and witty. And, um, you know, I don't even think I could have thought of anything quite that uh, sassy and smart to put on a sign. But <laughs> Um, so I took a lot of pictures of signs, um, but there was one sign that um, kind of embodied it for me, and it was a quote from Alice Walker, if you're familiar with her. She's an author. Um, she wrote The Color Purple, so most mm -hmm. people know that. But it was a quote from her, and it said, the most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. Mm -hmm. the, most, the most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. Yes. Exactly. And, and by, and by that, you know, for me, the way I, the lens I see the world through is that doesn't necessarily mean external power. That means internal power, right? So your relationship with your, whatever you want to call it, right? Your higher self, your, you know, the inner divine spark within you, right? That's where your power lies, right? Yeah. Um, and if you're, if you're pulling from that, that power, you know, is, is beautiful. It's, it's, it's powerful, you know, yeah. but it is kind and it is gentle and it is compassionate, right? Yeah. That's the power that I felt running through the streets of our nation's capital, uh -huh. covered in pink. Um, you know, that, that beautiful feminine energy that, that we need more of. Um, so, beautiful. yeah, power. Yeah power, but in the truest sense of the word. You know, you know my, uh, my spiritual guidance always talks to me about holy power and right. uh, helping people step into holy power. And the definition they gave me for it was a holy power is the complete expression of divine truth in real time without hesitation, manipulation, or control. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that divine power of, of, divine truth flowing in real time. And that definition can be both masculine and feminine energy. Sure. Uh, oh. Right. But, but I hear you that when I, when we talked yesterday, your, your excitement around this feminine energy, this uh, uh, you know, we've talked a lot in, in the woo, woo circles about the divine feminine uh, uh, springing forth. Well, I think this is what it looks like at the beginning. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and, and, and that there was so much energy about what people were wanting, what they were moving towards mm -hmm. versus just what they're fighting against. Sure. Uh, and I didn't, and that's what I don't, for me, and again, I can only speak to my experience. For me, my experience wasn't going to march to fight against something. It wasn't an anti-Trump rally. It, um, yeah. I mean, I think, I think for some people it was, you yeah. know, there were signs that said, <laughs> F Trump and you know this and right, that. Right, right. And I, I understand that. And then you know, on one level, I kind of feel a little bit of that too. But um, you know, sort of my higher self knows that it is it is not about this one person. Um, it is about the lopsidedness in which we find our country and our planet right now, um, and the need to bring forth that divine feminine energy. Um, you know so that things can be more in balance so that justice is not just for us right mm -hmm. it's for everyone right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
There is yeah. a. Uh, and I think I think that capitalism is is great. I think it's fine. I think we I think people should make money. I think people should be motivated to you know create new things and compete with each other for you know the best idea. And that's how you know that's how we move forward and grow. And um, but not at the expense of you know other people, the environment. That you know, right. So. Yeah. Um, Again, to me, it's more of that balance and just not fighting against, but bringing forth what we can bring forth, what mm -hmm. we can co-create. Mm -hmm. um. So there is something that keeps coming up for me around this because, uh, you know, a lot of people that I saw posting about it were asking, why do we need it? Mm -hmm. Right? What's the point? Mm -hmm. um, like Trump's president, he's in now, like we just got to deal with it, uh, get over it, right? And um, what I keep thinking about is my friend, Dr. Joan Rosenberg, uh, who's a very gifted therapist. And a couple months ago, she and I had dinner and I, you know, she's been in private practice for like 40 years. And so I said to Joan, I said, you know, Joan, in your 40 years of practice, if there's one thing that you've learned or come away with that maybe you didn't learn, you know, in your education, what is it? Um, and she told me two things actually. Uh, the first was it's people's inability to feel difficult feelings that causes so much distress and depression, which I agree with. Um, but the second thing, and this is more pertinent to this conversation is she said, I see that people go on an arc, uh, when they do transformation in these four stages of uh, number one, you must know what you know, which is like actually acknowledging what you know, what you feel in your gut, not because somebody else told you it's true, but because you know it right knowledge uh, that that is embodied. Uh, so number one, know what you know. Number two, speak what you know, get it out of your body's knowledge and out into the world, speak it. And that first time of speaking something can be feel so risky, yeah. right? Because we don't know how it's going to be received and are we going to get kicked out of tribe and are people not going to like us? And if we post it on Facebook, are people going to bash us? And, you know, uh, all, all the challenges that come in with speaking what we know. Um, the third is being what you know. Really yeah. taking the knowledge and doing your own personal transformation to become a living embodiment. embodiment of the thing you're sharing with the world. And then the fourth stage is share what you know. Now that it's embodied, be a voice, right? So know what you know, speak what you know, be what you know, share what you know. And uh, last week I did a, uh, I, I do a talk once a month in, in LA, as you know. And the topic was about becoming a tribal authority. And there were four phases to that, which was discovery, knowing who your tribe is, service, uh, which was going out and serving those people. Leadership, which is uh, guiding the tribe around their larger experience of transformation and evolution. And finally, advocacy. And the thing that really sparked for people was this idea of advocacy, of finding a cause that your tribe is collectively interested in and being a voice for it in service of a larger group. Um, and what I love about this idea of the Women's March is two things. One is it's allowing people to t go from knowing what they know to speaking what they know, right? And those signs are a version of speaking what you know, um, which is a precursor to being what you know, which is where the real evolution and leadership comes from, but you can't skip it. Um, so it's a starting place, is giving people a space to know what they know and speak what they know which I think is so, 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 so important. Um, you know, and, and, and then this piece of advocacy, which is to say, oh, these were really like, you know, quote unquote, normal people that put this on. It wasn't big celebrities. It wasn't some super PAC. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't some big political group. It was normal human beings saying, I know what I know and I need to speak what I know. And maybe there's other ladies and other men and other kids that know what they know too and need a place to speak it. Mm -hmm. And this country is founded on freedom of speech, right? 
and uh, uh, having civil discourse, uh, which again is something I think we've we've gotten away from in a large large way. Um, so before we open it up for any questions, I just want to see if there's anything else you you want to share about. Uh, in fact, here's what I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you just to tune in to what else there is for you to share because I feel like there is something and uh, just intuitively go, oh, here's what I think it is. Um, I think that, you know, you kind of said that maybe one of the people, you know, asked, you know, do we just need to get over it and, you know, be okay with um, – whoever's in office right now and um, do we really need this? Is this something that's needed? Um, and I would say regardless, again, of your um, political persuasion um, in a community, which we are, right, as a nation, mm -hmm. um, anytime there is someone who feels disenfranchised, left out of the conversation, marginalized, um, othered, right? Discriminated against, um, then it's needed, right? Mm. So, um, you know, I'd love to get to the point in human history where that, <laughs> where that never happens, right? But, um, until we do, um, we all there, we always want to let people have their, voice and work towards a more equitable society. Um, so no matter who, you know, is elected or not elected, um, if there are people that are, feel left out, um, then, you know, that is, that is needed. Mm -hmm. Clearly, clearly <laughs> there are people that feel that way or we would not have seen millions of people on the streets all over the world. Yeah. Um, so, um, and, and then the other piece of that is, um, it is about action and reclaiming um, power, both individual power and collective power um, in a positive way, you know, yeah. in the most true sense of, of, of that word, so. Good, thank you. And the other thing I wanna repeat that you said earlier is part of reclaiming that power is moving from consumerism back to citizenship. Yeah, you know, um, right. So each of us is responsible for uh, uh, one of the signs that someone had uh, said, I, you know, ever, most people know the serenity prayer, right? Um, pray to accept the things I cannot change, blah, 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 right? Um, I'm no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. Mm. Um, and that was another thing that just sort of really resonated with me until we get to a world where um, that works better for everyone. <laughs> it's our, it is our responsibility to do more than just spout things on social media about what we don't like. Yep. Awesome. Cool. Um, so I want to take some questions. Um, and uh, we can take some here over video. Uh, you can also type them into the chat or Q&A, um, and we'll get to those in a second. Uh, I did see somebody ask uh, for this definition of holy power, so I'll just repeat that once again. Uh, holy power is the complete expression of divine truth in real time without hesitation, manipulation, or control. And in fact, uh, my buddy Tim Kelly, when I shared that definition with him, he said, huh, that's interesting because normally we say that absolute power corrupts absolutely. He said, but underneath that definition, anything but holy power is what corrupts. So uh, let's, uh, Susan's saying, please say it again. Holy power is the complete expression of divine truth in real time. That's the first part. The complete expression of divine truth in real time without hesitation, manipulation, or control. Um, and uh, somebody else, Bobby said, the changing the things I cannot accept is a quote from Angela Davis. Great, thanks, Bobby. Um, so, wow, thank you. Yeah, uh, so feel free to type into either the chat or the Q&A, um, and then you can also press the button to raise your hand, and uh, I'll take a few of you 
uh, here. And I'm really like, I'm honestly interested in not just a, um, yeah, me too. I mean, that's fine. But I am interested in like, there are some real questions I see people grappling with. And I'm not, I'm not saying I have the answers or that my sister has the answers, but I'm curious about the questions. And I think we need to be able to have questions and have legitimate questions. Um, so Pamela said, uh, Kimberly, about how many people were there? Did you get any sense if they were from all over the country and outside of the U.S.? Um, so, yeah, they were definitely from all over the country um, and outside the U.S. Um, uh, I mean, the group I went to, they're four of the people are originally from India, um, but they do live here. Um, and uh, so I don't know. That, I don't, it's not like they flew in for the march. Um, perhaps there were people that did that. Yeah. Um, they were definitely from all over the U.S. Um, and what was the second part of the question? Um, it was, oh, let me go back to that screen. Uh, were they from all over the country inside the U.S.? And how many people were there? You know, I, I don't know how many people were there. Um, I've heard different um, reports and, you know, I, I also do special events as part of my job. So I know how hard that is to really accurately count exactly how many people were somewhere. But, you know, I've heard reports of anywhere from 500,000 to a million. Um, I can tell you it felt like that for sure. I mean, just I cannot even tell you. How, it was just overwhelming. I mean, every corner you turned, everywhere you looked, if you went down a different street, um, it, I mean, people were everywhere, men, women, children, um, straight people, gay people, trans people, uh, you know, people from every walk of life, every every background that looked like that I could you know, possibly imagine. It was, yeah. it was amazing. And here's what's also interesting to, to me about that. The focus for the Women's March wasn't necessarily a single issue. No, right. Um, and even in the follow-up, what they're asking people to do in terms of uh, uh, continuing to have a voice isn't about the Women's March organizers' issues. It's about your issues. That's right. And having a voice for the world you want to see. Right. What they're urging people to do is not to, they don't necessarily have a platform. What they're urging people to do is, you know, call your senators about things you care about. They're not telling us what to care about. Um, you know, call your House of Representatives, get, you know, state level, national level, talk to your city council people, run for office, get involved, start conversations with um, your neighbors, start conversations with your friends, start conversations with people that who are very different than you that you, you know, that you nor wouldn't normally talk to. Let's build bridges. Let's have conversations. So that's really interesting. Yeah. Got it. Uh, Pamela wrote in, I found the whole March thing very inspiring. How many people took a stand for what they wanted, but what has left me uh, felt ambivalent inside of me in all of this is knowing that resistance only creates more resistance. How do you reconcile this with participating in the March? Right. And like I said earlier, I, I, for me, it wasn't about resistance. I mean, I think there were people there who it was about resistance. Right. And, you know, if that's where they're at right now, that's fine. You know, we're all in, at different places in our journey. Um, it, let me just say one thing before we go on from that, because Lord knows I've preached this thing about like what you resist persists and what you can't be with owns you. And, you know, you cannot change that which you cannot love and all these spiritual principles around that. And I believe them. And. What I'm getting in this moment is that when people are in anger, there's really two choices. Express the anger or go numb. And if that's where somebody is at, uh, to have a form to express anger as a way to at least move the energy so then you can find something maybe more productive, I think is actually useful and worthwhile. And maybe, you know, if you're on this webinar and you weren't there, maybe you didn't need that. But I, I feel like there were people that just needed a place to like Wah! express energy to get the energy moving rather than go numb. Because good God knows, you know, it's easy to do that. It's easy to spiritualize our way out of anger and frustration and, uh, uh, and go numb. And so while I agree that a lot of the pushing against energy, uh, you know, spiritually we know 
what you fight against, you create more of, right? We know that. And the thing that I found inspiring talking to you, this is just like a brother talking to his sister, right? I was driving home from my boyfriend's house last night. That's where this webinar came from. Because the thing I heard from you, Kim, wasn't about pushing against, that it was about people finding a, a camaraderie around a world they want to see emerge. And yes, a lot of political dissatisfaction and a lot of people feeling like, wow, I feel like I was asleep at the wheel a bit over the election season, kind of kicked us in the ass a bit. Um, so I think there were obviously a lot of people that were par part of this movement that were against something, but there was uh, the thing I heard from you that inspired me so much was hearing that your experience was the overwhelming experience was moving towards something, that voice of advocacy. Yeah, and, and that was my experience. Again, I can only speak to my experience, but the energy was so positive and it was, and it was so, it, it was almost holy. Mm. Um, and I know that may sound strange to some people, um, but it was, it was beautiful. It mm. was beautiful. Um, and, it, and again, for me, at least for me, it's about um, finding other ways to bring forth the world that I envision, you know, uh, you know, as above, so below, right? Um, so it is about, you know, so I'm, I'm in a transmission meditation group. So that's a lot about sort of bringing down and anchoring energy. Um, and so I guess maybe that's just how I think of it. But it, for me, it's about bringing forth, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and we can do that through simple things like acts of kindness, meditation, things like that. And we can also do that through more active things um, of citizenship, active citizenship. Um, and um, I think it can be, you can get lost in the hopelessness of it and say, well, you just throw up your hands. Well, I, I can stay and do my spiritual stuff and that's okay. But you know, those politicians are always going to be corrupt and I, I just give up. There's nothing I can do. Mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. that's just, I just don't think that's true. <laughs> and I don't think you have to fight anything. Um, I think that you need to bring forth and build community. Um, Great. Good. Uh, so I'm going to take a few people uh, over the webinar. Once again, if you want to queue up, we'll be, we'll be on until the top of the hour, so another 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes. Um, just press the raise your hand button. Uh, Susan, let's start with you. And by the way, I will say, we'll talk a little bit about like, what can you do tangibly before we're, we're done. Hi, Susan. Uh, let me unmute you. There we go. Beautiful. So I, I'm moved by this whole conversation and there's so many questions that are coming up. And I've been listening to folks you know, speaking about the march and what they got. And, and I know a lot of people who went and I was there in spirit. And it, it's, so it's how, do, it, it's how do we hear both sides? Because as many people who were for what was being expressed, there were people, and it, it shocked me, who were against it, you know, that, that um, try to put it in a box rather than seeing it as an expression of love and unity, at least how, that, how I see it, you know, love and unity and really moving forward and creating a world that works for everyone. How do we bring that spirit of a creating a world that works for everyone? And, and what are you know? How do we sustain this? How do we keep moving this forward? And I like what Kim you know Kim is saying in terms of citizenship and getting people actively involved. I just it's like how do we keep it going? Mm -hmm. um, Kim, I didn't see what you have to say about that. Well, you know, I don't. <laughs> I would absolutely not pretend to have the answers to those. You know, Ready to go. <laughs> yeah. But, um, uh, but you know, I, I do think that, um, you know, so one of the personal things I've been grappling with, like, is, okay, how, okay, let me give you a little background here. You know, so, for example, some of the studies say that a lot of the people that may have voted for Obama and now voted for Trump were 
for people who are maybe in Rust Belt cities or economically left behind, or, right? You know, they feel like they're coal miners, whatever. I'm and in they, one of those states. Right. <laughs> so I can totally get that. So for example, my, my dad, Jeffrey's dad, uh, worked his entire career basically at General Motors, Delphi, um, was a couple years from retirement. This is in Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, and the plant closes down, right? He's forced into early retirement. The, yeah, I, it was just a mess, right? So they, he lost half of his pension, all sorts of things, right? And, and my, actually my husband at the time, I'm divorced now, but, you know, he was working there too. So, you know, then P, all these, six, this plant was 6,000 people, right? That's the size of a small town. Um, you know, all these people out of work. And then some of the people that could go back and get hired in new jobs where they were maybe making $30 an hour with a high school education, um, you know, maybe they could find a job, maybe they couldn't, but if they could, it was $10 an hour, right? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so how do you then um, make your mortgage payment, right? Or your rent payment? Um, you get your car repo, you end up homeless. And you, you know, people say, well, just sell your house, right? Just sell your house. I don't see what the big deal is. You can't sell your house when everybody else in the whole dang town has had, has, is in the same situation, right? Um, so people have had real economic impacts. and They're hurting. They're hurting and they feel left behind. So I know these people, yep. right? These yep. People are my people. Um, I haven't been personally in that situation, but it's, well, I actually have, I guess. Um, so, you know, so I get that. Um, so how, like my question, my, my thought is like, how do I have conversations with these people? How do I build a dialogue? How do I learn to listen and empathize and say, okay, how do we work together when it seems like we see the world so differently? Right. I ever talk to my uncle, you know, who I love, but who clearly is, you know, See, politically sees things very differently mm -hmm. from me and and build those bridges so I, I that's not an answer that's I'm, I guess I'm answering the question, question. right right we how can't can I, hear each other right how can we sit down across the table with a cup of coffee and have that conversation you know mm -hmm. um, and I don't I don't have the answer except for that you know uh, that maybe we just need to start having those conversations Maybe we shouldn't go through Thanksgiving never bringing up politics. Or maybe we shouldn't bring it up at, at, at Thanksgiving, but you know, maybe a different time. <laughs> um, you know, how do we sit down with people? Um, it's so easy to be with people that think like you, right? But when do we learn in life? We don't learn typically our greatest, you know, lessons through some kind of, you know, everything being on cloud nine, right? It's through these sort of difficult challenges that we face in life that we often learn really big things and grow, right? So how do we do that with people that are, and not surround ourselves with people that are exactly like us, which is so okay. common, right? And what are some of the, <laughs> you know, we have what, to complain about right. the same thing. <laughs> what are some of the structures we can leverage that already exist to, you know, to engage those conversations? And that's the thing. I mean, I don't know that they're there. I don't know that they're there. I mean, that's what I was talking, you know, after my meditation group with the folks that I meditate with mm -hmm. yesterday, like maybe we start having things, not anything formal, just maybe right. having, you know, we all have these people, they're our friends, they're our neighbors, right? Um, and we know that we love them, maybe they're great neighbors, but we know that they might think very differently from us in some ways. Um, how do we have people over for a cup of coffee or a glass of wine and just have a conversation and listen more than we talk, perhaps? You know? One thing that comes to mind for me around this is uh, I, I teach a lot of my clients how to do parts work which is about dialoguing with different parts of themselves, <laughs> um, right? And Susan, you've learned this. In fact, my sister's learned it as well. Um, but the principles of parts work is about how to learn to honor and respect yeah. a part of yourself that you're in judgment of so that you can move towards loving it, which can move into a transformational relationship with that part of yourself. And what do I teach in parts work? But how does questions like, where did you come from? What was going on that had you emerge in my life? Or in this case, you know, 
uh, tell me about your childhood. How were you raised? Um, what were some of the values you were raised with? Um, what have been some of your struggles over the years? Uh, you know, what, what do you care about and why? Um, and seeking, seeking understanding. So I think some of those basic principles of curiosity, mm -hmm. just understanding, is a huge thing. But the second thing, and I think this is something you were just both speaking about, is where are the forums in which you can do that? Right. And it might start in your own living room. That's what I feel. Right? Like, uh, it's funny for me saying this, living in Los Angeles, because I live in a place where I don't know my neighbors. And I don't feel like my neighbors have, like it's not a place where our neighbors, now my boyfriend lives in more of a community, right? Where he knows all his neighbors, different thing. Um, but a place like my sister's uh, town in North Carolina, um, you know, that's a place where you say hi to your neighbors and you borrow sugar, <laughs> right? You wave to strangers. Right, and you, yeah, you wave to strangers. Um, and, and I think maybe it starts in your own living room. There, there very well may be other forms as well, and I'd love for people to post in chat if there's uh, other forms that are coming to mind for you. Um, but that's, that's really good. Um, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. There's a few others, so I want to get to them mm -hmm. before, uh, before we close. Um, uh, let's see here. Da -da -da -da. How do I do this? There we go. All right, good. Thank you, Susan. Uh, let's see. Before we move on, uh, somebody asked uh, about uh, wanting to hear about your daughter. Now, your older daughter, my niece, uh, couldn't go because she had to take the SATs. But Bella, who's 12, went. Who is it like for Bella? Um, well, you know, you'd have to ask her that. But Okay. Well, <laughs> Did she say anything? Like for Bella. Um, well, you know, so my youngest daughter is, she always wants to seem, in, in this age, right, she's almost 13. Um, it's also her personality. She always wants to seem pretty unaffected. Right. <laughs> she's a preteen. Yeah. So, um, uh, but, um, you know, I, I know that she was, um, I, and of course it's always the thing where, you know, it's, it's not interesting, um, when your mom says we're going to the march until your favorite YouTuber says they're going to the march, right? <laughs> Suddenly it's interesting and you want to go. Um, similarly, you know, whatever I'm saying, you know, is, is not, while we're there, is not that interesting until, you know, uh, so one of the famous speakers or performers gets up on stage and then it means something to her. <laughs> um, so, but it's okay, whichever way she can hear it is fine. Um, uh, but she was, uh, she, she did think it was, it was pretty interesting. She thought it was pretty cool on the way home. I asked her, you know, so what do you think? And she thought, she said, I thought it was, I thought it was pretty cool. And, and I said, well, what do you think is cool about it? She said, well, I don't know. And I said, well, what didn't you like about it? She said, people stepped on my new shoes and got them dirty. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm, I can't, I don't know exactly how it affected her or, but I, I I'm hoping that it was, and she said it was a positive experience. I can only imagine that she'll be unpacking this for years. <laughs> uh huh. I know cool. I will. Good. Uh, let's take a couple uh, conversations. Let's see, Dawn. Let's see if I can get you online here. There we go. And I will unmute you. Don, if you could move your, uh, yeah, there we go. Good. And let me uh, unmute you. Wow. Awesome. I didn't expect ahead, to be on like this. <laughs> Hi. Glad you are. Thank you. Hi. Um, well, I guess this is part of my stepping out that I <laughs> said I needed to do. Knowing what you know, speaking what you know, being what you know, sharing what you know. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I share Kimberly's, um, I was there in DC also, and it was just a pull automatically to be there. And absolutely, it was a positive expression of people's humanity. It was just a sea of humanity. It was huge. And every, every 
it was um, every person you can possibly think of was there. <laughs> and what I thought was so beautiful that I wanted to share was um, how some of the men actually started the chanting. So there was a, a there was a young man, and he started chanting, um, uh, like your body, your choice. And then all the women would respond with my body, my choice. And I just thought that was so awesome that he did that for so long. Um, it was just a lovely experience. Yeah. And, and, like, and like Kimberly said, it was every subject that could have been of concern for people was there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that, I think it was less about a specific platform and more about, um, people having their voices heard. And I kind of go back to that whole thing about sort of, you know, the Tea Party movement, right? Um, and the, the, the Wall Street movement. Those are, those are all sort of populist movements about people feeling like, you know, their voices aren't heard and people feel, saying, I want to be a part of this conversation. I, you know, I don't want uh, a form of community or a form of government because Remember, our government is based on community. It's based on people, government by the people. I, I don't want it to be something that's done to me. I want it to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, I, I guess I would urge people to, to kind of think about what's important to them and see how they, what ways make sense to take action for them. And, it, and, and the group, the group that I'm talking to here understands sort of the, sort of the larger spiritual principles behind that. Um, and let me just say also, like, even if we don't know larger spiritual principles behind something, I think that like when you talked on about it being a sea of humanity, mm -hmm. I think there's something in our DNA that knows something about basic relationship, about mm -hmm. love, about listening, mm -hmm. about caring, about empathy, right? About connectedness. About connectedness. Uh, Don, I think, did you post about Van Jones? I did. So Don also, because the thing I want to be sure, we we're, we just have about four more minutes before the top of the hour. Uh, and I promise this would just be 60 minutes today. So one of the things I want to be sure we talk about before we close is like, what can you do? So Don, you posted that Van Jones has a three-part series on YouTube called The Messy Truth. Yes. Uh, which is about bridging conversations with, between people and that your local community showed these videos and worked in small groups. So can you just say a little bit about that? Yeah, well, it's uh, Van Jones before the election was uh, uh, trying to understand people who were going to be voting for Trump and get his, and he was concerned about um, the, the rhetoric during the candidacy. And so we went into Gettysburg and they're, they're a wonderful series. They're short, they're about nine or 10 minutes each. And then the, I will find the uh, questions that the community put together. It was just a series of like three basic questions, but it was very enlightening. Then we w worked in small groups of, you know, five to seven people. Um, originally they thought maybe 25 people would come from our community and at least 75 showed up. Mm -hmm. And it was so pervasive. I mean, it was, uh, you know, every walk of life, every every community within our, in, within our community, mm -hmm. uh, was represented. It was really eye opening and enlightening in that way. Could you do me a favor and send a, a link to that and maybe those questions to support yeah. at jeffreyvandyke.com? Okay. And uh, okay. if we get those, we'll include those in the email tomorrow with a recording from today's conversation. Terrific. Thank Terrific. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you. Yeah. And let me also just say, you know, one of the things, look, I didn't know what I could do. And uh, I, like I said, I was just driving home from my boyfriend's house last night and got a chance to call my sister. And she was just like, oh my God, it was amazing. The energy was so beautiful. And I just said, hey, I, I think that we could have a conversation with my community. Would you be game? And, you know, this morning I was like, so we're going to do it on uh, a Zoom web conferencing. She's like, okay, do I have to have a camera on my computer? Right. <laughs> right. And she went and borrowed the daughter's computer and, and here we are. 
so you know even this is just saying oh, oh, I don't know what we can do but if there's an impulse do it um, and uh, uh, another thing that's on the um, the Women's March website, which is uh, something we'll post in the link tomorrow as well, um, which is just womensmarch.com. And I think there's also a link, womensmarch.com slash 100. But there is, um, yeah, womensmarch.com slash 100. Uh, 10 actions in 100 days. And they, they listed out some very simple actions of just printing out a postcard and sharing what you care about with your representatives. Um, and, you know, here in LA, I've even like wondered, like, should I even bother calling my representatives? You know, they're all Democrats uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, they're in the minority and whatnot. But then I thought, when I saw this today, I thought, well, yeah, I should send postcards to my representatives as well, even if they're fighting for or moving towards or advocating for the things that I care about wouldn't it feel good to them for them to know that there are people behind them? Um, so that mattered to me. Uh, so that's something I'm going to do. So I'll, I'll, I'll post a couple resources in the email tomorrow. If you have resources uh, that you're aware of and want to share them with this community, uh, send them to support at Jeffrey Van Dyke. And I'll type that into the chat right now. Support at jeffreyvandyke.com um, and uh, uh, oh, I don't know why it's not posting <laughs> uh, but uh, send it to support at jeffreyvandyke.com and um, uh, I'll see which things uh, feel right to include in that email. Uh, I really want to include things that support anybody of really any political leaning and persuasion uh, but to me this is about knowing what you know, speaking what you know, which allows you to become more of what you know and share yourself in a bigger and bigger way in this world, uh, which is uh, something I feel like we're all called to do. And I know for me, when, when Trump was elected, I felt like uh, you know, I wanted to dig into my work more deeply and was advocating for my tribe to do that. And I still believe in that, right? It was, a, to me, a bigger call just to, to really do my work in the world. Um, but in the light of this Women's March, there's something a little bit more as well for me, which is going beyond just what I do in the world and, and seeking to do more of it into what can I do as part of my citizenship in this world? And uh, that's something I'm going to keep inquiring about. And I encourage you to do the same thing. Uh, Kim, is there anything you want to share by way of closing? Yeah, just two things. One thing is, you know, I, I personally believe strongly in, you know, the, the divine spark in every being, you know, so namaste, right? Um, and that includes uh, people who you don't politically agree with, including mm -hmm. the president. Mm -hmm. um, and even though maybe sometimes it's really hard to see that in other people, <laughs> um, or they don't show it, um, it must be there. Mm -hmm. At least that's what I believe. And so um, bless them right? Bless yeah. them, love them, yeah. right? Uh, listen to them, uh, try to form community with them, um, try to do uh, maybe just positive things for the community together with them where you don't even talk about politics, right? Mm -hmm. Build a relationship mm -hmm. so that eventually you can have a conversation. Yeah. Um, so, you know, namaste humanity, right? Yeah. Um, and secondly, um, we're the ones we've been waiting for right? We're our own saviors. Um, uh, both are with our own internal growth, right? I, I can't wait for someone else to save me. I have to do the work myself, right? Mm -hmm. I have to turn the battleground into the playground. Mm -hmm. um, that work should be joyous, but um, we're the ones we've been waiting for. Yeah, so. beautiful. Thank you. And um, the thing I want to just share is a huge uh, heart full of gratitude. I appreciate you being willing to uh, hop on here kind of last minute and just say like, yeah, sure, I'll come talk to your community. <laughs> uh, and to everybody that uh, joined us live, uh, as well as those of you that will be uh, watching the recording. Um, I know there is hunger. I know there is yearning. 
uh, I know there are questions. And um, sometimes it's easy to go like, I don't know what I can do and just throw in the towel. And sometimes that gets the best of us. Uh, but if you can hang in there with the questions, if you can hang in there with the uncertainty, if you can hang in there uh, knowing that there is a divine spark, even in Donald Trump, <laughs> even if you can't see it, uh, and focus on that spark and wanting to see more and more and more of that spark emerge in the world, emerge through our present, emerge in our politics, emerge in our community, emerge in your own heart and soul, uh, that's what I'm in service to with you. That's what I'm advocating for. Uh, and to find uh, more and more places where we can just put our feet on the ground to express that kind of love. Uh, I, I believe the more we're able to do that, the more we will see and create a world that works for everyone. So with that, thank you so much for uh, being here. Much love to you all, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.